In this lecture I will discuss wireless data transmission using an XB Wi-Fi chip and the PIC microcontroller's USART serial communication interface. XB chips look like what you see on the screen. They come in a variety of form factors mostly looking like what you see there but with different antenna configurations. So as you can see you can on some XB chips actually screw in a different antenna and on some the antenna is built into the board itself. They are relatively low cost networking radios. Typically a wireless radio like this might cost about twenty to twenty five dollars and they rely on serial communication of various protocols. The XP chips also have some other pins available. They have some GPIO digital pins that can be configured to output or input some signal. And you can also perform analog to digital conversion on some of those pins as well. And they can rely on several data formats of serial communication. This is the pin diagram table showcasing all of the pins on the chip. We will not be using most of the pins on there because they are dedicated to analog to digital communication and digital GPIO, but we will be relying upon several of those pins to be able to provide power and ground references and to transmit and receive data. We will be using pin 1, which is our VCC. That will take in a 3.3 volt supply. We will also be using pins 2 and 3. That will be where our data will be transmitted or received. And we will also be using pin 10 where we will provide a ground reference. On the other side of the chip we will be using pin 15 which is our associated pin. And what that will indicate is whether the radio is properly associated with the wireless network. And so what you will see there we will configure it with an external resistor and LED and that LED when properly powered will turn on solid and then when the radio is properly connected to the wireless network it will blink at about 1 Hertz. The XB's must be programmed and we will use XCTU software to configure that. The wireless radios that you have been provided are already programmed to work on a router that I will provide and they are programmed with various information and so that includes the SSID which is the network name a password if there is one and I've already put in the password that I use on my network and a baud rate we will use 9600 baud on our network and you can also implement various security standards such as WEP and WPA and you can set up a specific address to send to so in some cases you may have a static IP address set up to send to a particular, um, let's say, an external hard drive or a wireless printer, or you can do a more global broadcast sending to all other devices on the network. And that will be how ours will be configured. I will be sending to every one of the devices within range on the network, so that way all of you who are within range of the wireless network can get the signal of interest. You can also specify the transmission protocol, and so in this case we're going to be using the USART format, and you can either use static or dynamic IP allocation. And so what that means is your IP address is effectively like a mailing address on the network. So if you are sending web traffic, those kind of things, between digital devices, you need to know their IP address, and they can be dynamically allocated such as on a university campus as students enter campus, leave campus, log on or log off their devices there is a pool of IP addresses available and so as the different addresses are taken up by different devices they get pulled off of the pool and then if that student leaves campus or shuts down their device then that address comes back into the pool and so DHCP can dynamically allocate one of the available addresses in the pool to a particular device. You can also request a static IP and these are useful 
if you want to, for various purposes, maintain the same IP address all the time. This is good if you want to host a web site and you want to make sure that that web server is always at the same address. This is also useful for things like networked printers so that when you send something it is always sent to the same address. That configuration is saved in a double EEPROM on board the chip. You will not need to do this but I will give you a demonstration of that in class. So as previously mentioned these are the connections that will need to be made. Pin 1 will be connected to 3.3 volts. We will use a voltage regulator and I'll talk about that in our live lecture period. And then pins 2 and 3 are for the RX and the TX pins respectively. Pin 10 gets a ground reference and then pin 15 is where you will connect a 330 ohm resistor in series with an LED and that LED will then go to ground and that will be the association indicator to indicate whether the radio is associated with the wireless network. So here's the basic schematic. The voltage regulator is that D-shaped uh, three pin chip that you are given and in the middle is going to be your VN that will take in the VDD signal. The output voltage will be on the left side as oriented this way with the flat side toward the top and the right side will be the ground reference so you will want to connect that side to the same ground that is connected to the pick and so that V out is what will be connected to pin 1 of the XB wireless chip. It's also important to note that the capacitor must span the V out and ground pins and so that is because with just the voltage regulator and just VDD coming in, you cannot source enough current to really wake up the radio. So there's a specific current requirement. In order to get that fulfilled, we need a capacitor to store up charge and then send a wake up signal. So the capacitor you've been provided will allow for a little bit more current to be provided to the XB Wi-Fi chip in order to wake it up. Also note that the capacitor that you have is polarized, so it is very important that you connect the positive side of that capacitor to V out, the negative side of that capacitor to the ground side. Failure to do that can blow up the capacitor and you never want to do that. You want to make sure you properly orient electrolytic capacitors in the right way. So the USART will be our serial communication protocol and we will be using that in order to send and receive data in a lab this week and also for the final project. So in the final project we'll be receiving various data, you will process that and you will have one lab this week just to make sure you have the schematic built correctly and that you can receive messages. So I will be broadcasting a message repetitively on a router and it will be up to you to pull in that message. In a previous lecture we discussed how to program for serial communication and the various um, registers that are associated with that. We will use the same exact configuration whether we are doing wired or wireless communication. And so the XB radio simply takes that serial communication and takes care of the broadcast itself. But just as a refresher of what we need to do, we need to set up a baud rate and so we will use 9600 baud. The formulas will depend upon our value of the BRGH bit which is for higher or lower baud rate generation and so the formula either divides by 64 or divides by 16. The frequency of the oscillator times the value that you put in SPBRG. Recall that SPBRG is actually two registers. There's SPBRGH and SPBRGL, and those two registers come together to form the equation that you see here. If you were using 16-bit mode for baud rate generation, then you would use both of those bytes. If you're simply using 8-bit mode, you would only use the low byte. We are using an 8 megahertz crystal oscillator, so our FOSC is 8 megahertz. If you were to enable the 4 time PLL that your chip is capable of, you would use 32 megahertz there. And then if we set BRGH equal to 1, 
we can use this formula here and divide that by 16 times 1 plus the SPBRG. And if you put in 51 decimal as the SPBRG, 1 plus that is 52, that works out to right around 9600 baud, just a little bit faster than that at 9615. The transmit status and control register, which you can read all about in section 31.3 starting on page 363 in the data sheet, will be a very important register. We're going to be using the asynchronous mode, and in that mode, bit 7 becomes a don't care, so we won't worry about that. TX9 allows us to determine whether we are transmitting 9-bit data. We are only going to be using 8-bit data, so we're going to put a 0 in there because we are not transmitting 9-bit data. TXEN is a very important bit. If you are trying to transmit anything, you will put a 1 there. For the lab assignment this week and for your final project, you're going to set this to 0 because I will create the transmitter, you're going to create the receiver. The sync bit allows for asynchronous mode and you will set that to 0. There is a send B on bit 3 that will allow us to send a break. We're not going to actually use that so you're going to set that to 0. And then BRGH is whether or not you're using high speed mode for the baud rate generation. So we already talked about that previously. And then TRMT tells you whether or not there is a data transmission in progress. So if the transmit shift register is empty, you see a 1 there. And if it is full, then you have a 0 there. And then the TX9D in bit 0 is used for transmitting that ninth bit if you were sending a ninth bit of data. We're not going to use that um, because we're using 8-bit data transmission. The RC1 STA is for the receive status and control. So we just now talked about the transmit status and control. Let's look at the other side with the receive. And so in this case, this is register 31-2, which you can read all about starting on page 364 in the data sheet. Bit 7 is SPEN, that is the serial port enable. You're going to want to put 1 in there. That will enable RC7 as the RX and RC6 as the TX um, in order to just turn on the serial port. We will have some additional configuration to make that so using our Ansel C and also our Tris C register and the um, RC6 PPS register. We'll talk about that in class. And then bit 6 is the RX9. So if you receive 9-bit data, you would put 1 in there, but we're not going to use 9-bit data. We're going to set that to a 0. And then SREN in bit 5 is a don't care in asynchronous mode. So we're not going to worry about that. CREN in bit 4 is a very important bit. You're going to need to set that in order to enable continuous receive. So if you are building a receiver and you want to continuously receive data across that serial channel, you will need to set that bit. And then ADEN is only used in 9-bit mode, so we're not going to worry about bit 3. Bits 2 and 1 are used for error checking, just to see if an error occurred in transmission. We're not going to worry about those bits for our purposes. And then RX9D, if you were using 9-bit mode, that would be where the ninth bit would be received. And so you could process that. We're not going to worry about that because, again, we're using 8-bit mode. Here's the general setup for the transceiver. You're going to use TRIS-C and ANSEL-C to make RX and TX pins digital inputs and outputs, respectively. So you're going to need to make the RX pin an input, the TX pin an output, and both of those are going to be configured for digital operation. And so ANSEL C will be used to make that the case. We're going to use RC6 PPS, and what that does is allows RC6 to be used as TX. And so just like we had to do very similar things for RC2 for the PWM and the motor lab, we are going to be setting this to hexadecimal 14. And that is from the data sheet. We'll talk about that more in the lab. You also need to set up the baud rate. We've already talked about how to do that. But BRG16 will set it up depending upon whether you're using 16-bit or 8-bit mode. And then the SPBRGH, if you are using 16-bit mode. Certainly the SPBRGL, whether or not you are using 16-bit mode, you'll need that. And then the BRGH determines which of those formulas apply. 
You're going to enable asynchronous mode by putting a zero in sync. You're going to enable the serial port by saying SPEN equals one, and we'll set up for 9-bit mode, so we'll make both TX9 and RX9 zeros. And if you're transmitting, then you would say TXEN equal one. You're not going to do that. I will do that on my code. And then if you're receiving, we'll say CREN equals one. To start the transmission of data, if you were to write the transmitter, you would write an 8-bit value to TX1 reg. And so what that will do is it will copy the value that you put in there into the transmit shift register, and then it will ship, a, ship out the bits one bit at a time, starting with the least significant bit, moving to the most significant bit. In order to receive that transmission, you can perform an interrupt and use an interrupt service routine, but we're going to simply pull the RCIF. So we're not going to do anything until we receive that particular signal. And so we're going to pull RCIF, that's our receive flag, and when it goes high, that means the data is ready. So we're going to use a while not RCIF with a semicolon. That's going to be a hard wait until that flag goes high, and then we can read the data from the RC reg. Coordinating transceivers is very important. So if you have a transmitter and a receiver, it's important that they operate at the same baud rate, and it's also important that you know something about the data packets that you're going to be receiving. So in some cases, you can send some information over the network to say how many bytes of data are coming in the packet, things like that, or you can simply know the format that the data is coming in, how many bytes are going to be exchanged, and at some time you may be a reader and at some time you may be a sender.